Hi, good evening and, and welcome to uh, the CPD webinars. Um, my name is Andy Thomas and I will be hosting the webinar tonight on behalf of Andy Ormrod, who uh, sadly couldn't make it. Um, for those who are new to webinars um, and this is your first experience, we have a few rules that you need to follow um, just so you, you're aware of what's actually happening and uh, you can enjoy the webinar um, in comfort. Firstly of all, the presenter can't see or hear you. So all those attending, we can't see you and we can't hear you. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, what we'll do is any questions at the end, the presenter will um, ask any questions at the end and um, we'll get them to straight to you so uh, you can listen in. And I'll answer them. I'm sorry, ask them and he'll answer them. Um, to ask any questions, if you look at your go to panel webinar panel and um, you will see that um, you have a questions button if you click on that and type in questions you'll be able to an answer ask any questions um, for those who are uh, with CPD me um, your certificates will be issued at uh, automatically at the end of the broadcast that will come through to you and that will automatically drop into your CPD portfolio and um, what I will say is you do need to listen to the whole webinar to receive the certificate um, also, for members, the certificate and link will be in your CPD within the next 24 hours. You'll also have uh, access to the, the video to view again, should you so wish. Um, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce you uh, very briefly, and I'll let Paul introduce yourself. But tonight we've got uh, Paul Younger, uh, who's a paramedic, who's going to be talking, giving us an introduction to paramedic point of care ultrasound. Um, I'm just going to hand over the uh, screen now to, uh, to Paul. Sorry, two seconds. Bear with me, I'll just uh, transfer this over to Paul. There we go, Paul, that should be coming over to you now. Okay, here we go. Excellent. So if you bring your presentation up on screen and then that's it, yes, we can see that, Paul. Uh, thank you very much and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now and then leave it over to you, thank you very much. Okay, good evening. Yes, my name is Paul Younger. I'm a, an advanced paramedic with North East Ambulance Service. I'm also a vice chair of the College of Paramedics and I'm the uh, lead for ultrasound for the college as well. Uh, I've been involved in uh, ultrasound for about five years um, and uh, brought about its introduction uh, into the critical care ambulance response unit in uh, Northeast Ambulance Service. Um, so when most people think about ultrasound, uh, this is what they think about. So that's what most people uh, think about when they think about ultrasound. But when we think about ultrasound for, point, for paramedics, we're thinking uh, much more of point of care ultrasound. Uh, and we're thinking about you know, what we can use that ultrasound for and how we can try and uh, incorporate that into paramedic practice. Uh, so what you can see here on the screen, uh, this is one of the point of care uh, devices. This is a Mark II uh, fee scan by GE. Uh, this is gaining in popularity in pre-hospital care. Uh, and on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see uh, a parasonal uh, long-axis view of the heart. Uh, this is the type of view that you'll get uh, with a point-of-care device, um, which is you know, quite usable. Um, you know, and this technology has moved along uh, greatly in the last few years. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see how this could be utilized. Um, and this is obviously somebody who's on a, an autopulse and showing you how you could use uh, this device if somebody was in cardiac arrest. I'm just uh, getting this to move on. Whoa. So um, ultrasound, so what is ultrasound? And uh, ultrasound and how does it work? Uh, so this is my representation of how ultrasound works. So uh, ultrasound, what you've got is a probe or a transducer. Uh, this transducer has a line of piezoelectric crystals um, along behind a protective cover. Uh, and when you bring uh, that into contact uh, with something and you turn on the machine, what happens is these crystals um, take electrical energy and they turn it into mechanical energy and they send out uh, pulses of ultrasound 
and this will then come into contact with the tissues and the vessels underneath uh, and it will send that signal, that electrical signal coming from various crystals within the, the probe to a processor and that processor itself will then turn that information into a picture uh, and that's how in a very basic way ultrasound works. Um, the reason we use the gel uh, isn't for sliding up and down on, on the patient's arms or on their abdomen or chest, uh, it's to remove the air because air is a very poor conductor of sound um, so therefore if you had air in between your probe and whatever it is you're trying to scan uh, you would get a very poor image uh, in probably no image at all. Um, so we use the gel to basically force the air out of the way so that you can get a good ultrasound image. So you know what how does it interpret these things and what do they look like? So generally we use the Guinness analogy which is uh, tissue and air looks white and fluid looks black. Uh, but it's not as simple as uh, black and white it's often 50 shades of grey uh, and so basically as it's getting the returning signal it's interpreting the amplitude from that and creating the image from uh, that signal. So how can we use, how can paramedics use ultrasound in their everyday practice? Now how does it make, how can you use that to help make you, uh, help with your clinical decision making? So one of the first things I want to discuss is pulse checks. So pulse checks in, in cardiac arrests, and we've all been there where you have people saying they can feel a pulse or not feel a pulse. Uh, and ultrasound can be really useful for this. Um, and if you look at the literature around uh, pulse checks, healthcare professionals are not great at doing this. So you know, in the literature, 45% could not detect a pulse of 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, only 15, uh, 16.5 could detect a pulse in 10 seconds. And obviously, you know that was the old standard of 10 seconds in the, the latest guidance it's down to five um, and only two percent could accurately recognize that someone was pulseless in less than 10 seconds um, and there's one paper that really stands out for me uh, which is this one which is basically only now on 50 percent of healthcare professionals were able to detect a pulse in less than five seconds and you know looking at the changes in the guidance um, you know that's quite worrying that's the equivalent of flipping a coin um, so your, your chance of being right is 50-50 and the reason I bring this up and why ultrasound is so useful um, is when you've got patients um, like in this image here so this image here uh, is a, a patient who is in a low output state uh, and this patient you know you're looking at 50 millimeters of mercury uh, as a blood pressure for this patient um, and this uh, is a scan of the heart this is um, a subcostal view looking so it's looking from beneath the sternum up into the heart uh, and what you can see there closest uh, to the, where the uh, the top of the screen is the uh, left uh, the sorry the right ventricle and the right atria and further down you've got the left ventricle and atria uh, and you know this patient would be very difficult to detect a pulse on uh, but what ultrasound allows you to do is see that this patient does have an output and they're just in a low output state and therefore you can try and manage these patients uh, correctly um, and not assume that they don't have a pulse and carry on CPR so pulse checks are something where ultrasound can be you know incredibly useful in your clinical decision making and this type of scan can be easily done in five to ten seconds uh, the next thing is is reversible causes and this is something where people uh, often talk about reversible causes in cardiac arrest um, but most of them are very difficult to detect um, and you know and sometimes very difficult to treat pre-hospitally um, so here we have the four H's and the four T's that everyone will remember from their paramedic course and what I've got here is a list so if they're in green these are the ones that we can quite accurately you know detect and deal with so hypoxia we can give the patients oxygen um, hypovolemia well you know if the patient's in a trauma situation then you may be able to work out the, the hypovolemic but what do you do about the medical patients who are hypovolemic how do you work out that they, that is their reversible cause uh, hypo and hypokalemia and metabolic disorders uh, you know you, you, you can't detect pre-hospitally apart from glucose um, you know hypothermia uh, we can take a temperature of the patient so we can use that as a reversible cause um, you know thrombosis how do you detect the thrombosis uh, pre-hospitally uh, tamponade is the same I mean everybody talks about looking for distended neck veins and muffled heart sounds but how are you going to do that uh, in a cardiac arrest situation uh, it's very difficult to detect anyway uh, 
and toxins and then tension pneumothorax. Now obviously with the tension pneumothorax you can have a listen with the stethoscope, you can percuss the chest, um, but in most trauma situations they're not quiet environments. Uh, you've got other emergency services on scene who are trying to uh, do their work and so it's quite difficult uh, to listen with a stethoscope. So how can ultrasound help us with the reversible causes? So ultrasound can help us look for hypervolemia, it can help us look for thrombosis, and it can help us look for tamponade, and it can help us look for tension pneumothorax. So let's take the first one. So hypervolemia, how can we look for hypervolemia? Uh, this is an image, this is um, an infenia vena cava, uh, and this has been scanned uh, just below the sternum. And but most of the time your vena cava and a nice healthy person uh, will collapse about 50% during normal respiration um, and anything over 50% is associated with hypovolemia um, and you can in you know if it's very very severe uh, hypovolemia you can actually see this, the two walls of the infina vena cava collapse and the reason this happens is your IVC uh, acts as uh, the, one of the reservoirs within your body for blood um, and therefore if it's collapsing you know basically this patient's become hypervolemic, they've been trying to compensate and they just can't compensate anymore and what you're seeing is that affected on the ultrasound image. So what this is telling you is that this patient um, is empty and you need to do something about it. Um, so that's looking at you know, what we can do with hypervolemia. So let's look at the next one. Um, so thrombosis. So this is looking again um, in, in vena vena cava. What you can see here um, is that this is not collapsing. So in the previous image you see a total collapse uh, and this one what you see is it's very engorged. Um, I mean that, that's more than two centimeters. Um, this is associated with you know back pressure in the right hand side of the heart and this is something that you see in pulmonary embolus um, and you know by scanning the patient although you may have a history of chest pain shortness of breath but by using ultrasound what you can see is the effect that that's having and it's creating that back pressure within the right hand side of the heart and you're ending up with an engorged uh, infenia vena cava there um, and there's the image again So what about myocardial infarction, another type of thrombus? Um, well, it can help with that as well. Uh, I know everyone will say, yes, I've got a 12 lead ECG, um, but with ultrasound, what you can do is scan the walls of the heart. And obviously, when you're doing a 12 lead ECG, you're predominantly looking at the left ventricle. And we can look at the left ventricle with ultrasound as well. Uh, and this is a, a parasternal short axis view. So this is a view um, scanning from the left-hand side of the sternum. Uh, and you're basically, what you can see there is that circular type structure. That's the left ventricle. Uh, what's got MV, that's the mitral valve. And what happens it when you have somebody that's how, that's infarcting is that so that part of the muscle within the heart um, stops working properly. So what you see is when the heart's contracting, that the heart will generally contract and th thicken to about 50, um, uh, an extra 50%, so about 150% it'll contract to. And that's quite normal, but what happens when you have uh, an infarct is because that section of muscle isn't working correctly, is that you see that on the screen. So you can quite often, and I've heard of people detecting uh, MIs uh, before they get the ECG changes. So they'll have somebody very suggestive of having an MI but no ECG changes. Uh, they've scanned the heart and what happens is they can see that there's some dysfunction in the heart wall and that's led them to believe that there's obviously something going on there. Uh, they've repeated the ECG and what they've seen uh, is that the patient is infarcting. So you, you know, by using ultrasound you can try and detect things sooner. Uh, and again this is a scan that can easily be done by a paramedic in the field, in the patient's home or in the back of an ambulance um, and as it says there you can sometimes see these changes on ultrasound prior uh, to seeing them on uh, an ECG. Uh, the next uh, reversible cause I want to look at is cardiac tamponade. Um, so you know we're saying about cardiac tamponade the muffled heart sounds the distended neck veins um, but Cardiac tamponade is really easy to see on ultrasound because if you remember earlier, fluid is black um, and 
you know, although there should be a bit of fluid around the heart, there shouldn't be a lot. Um, and this is again at a, a parasternal long axis view. Um, so this is scanning from the, the side of the sternum, uh, looking down at the heart. Uh, what you can see in this image, uh, the bottom part is the left ventricle, um, and you can see the, you know, the mitral valve opening and closing, flicking up and flicking the um, the septum of the the heart wall there. Uh, if you look around the heart, you'll be able to see that there's black fluid around the heart, um, and this is, you know, it's very dependent on the history of the patient you've got, uh, because you can also get pericardial effusions. Um, but if you have a trauma patient, if you have somebody who has blunt trauma, and you scan the patient and you find fluid around the heart, um, that that's a cardiac tamponade until proven otherwise. Um, so, you know, using ultrasound, we can look for cardiac tamponades, and that's, you know, something that's very, very difficult to detect uh, without the use of ultrasound. So reversible causes, um, pneumothorax. So this is a different type of scan. This is uh, using a linear probe, and this is looking at the uh, the intercostal space. And what you can see is halfway down that scan. I hope you can see there's like ants running backwards and forwards, and little comets' tails coming off, and that's the pleura sliding against each other. Uh, and what that allows you to know is if, if you've got the presence of pleura, um, it's got a negative predictive value of 99.2 to 100% that the patient doesn't have a pneumothorax. So if you can see that, you pretty much know that the patient does not have a pneumothorax. Um, and again, this is a very easy scan to do. Um, and if you're looking at this in a, in a traumatic patient, um, you know it's got a sensitivity of 98.1 and a specificity of, of 99.2 of detecting traumatic pneumothoraxes as well. Um, so you know what this is is it's telling you there isn't a, a pneumothorax. Um, and if you've got the absence of that pleural sliding, so that sort of the, what it looks like the ants going backwards and forwards in the comet tails, um, that basically the pleura are not sliding against each other, and there's a pneumothorax present. Um, that's in what we call a brightness mode, um, so that's where you've taken um, the amplitude of the return signal and it's created that picture. Um, but there's another way of looking at this that's uh, really, really good for looking at pneumothoraxes, and this is something called M mode, and M mode's taking the signal against time. So it puts a beam of ultrasound straight through the middle of that image, and then it measures that return against time. And what it creates uh, is a bit like a barcode. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side, you've got what a normal chest would look like. Um, so if you scan somebody, you scan that intercostal space uh, and the pleura, this is what you'll see. And so we often describe this as looking like a beach in the sea. Um, so at the bottom, you've got the beach, and the top, you've got the sea. And if you see this, this is a really good sign because this is showing that there isn't a pneumothorax at that point. You have, you know, the pleura are sliding against each other. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you've got, you've got what you would see in a, a, a pneumothorax. So that's where the lung has collapsed and the returning signal, as I say, air is very, very poor. It's passing ultrasound, and you're getting that return signal, and we get what we call the barcode sign. Uh, and this is something that you would look, you'd see, and you'd look for when scanning someone for a pneumothorax. Um, and again, you know, this is an easy scan that you could do. Um, I know this patient's perfectly healthy because this is a scan I did of myself. Um, though I didn't create a pneumothorax, um, but I scanned myself to show how easy it is to do this. So by using ultrasound for reversible causes, uh, what we can see um, is that, you know, from where we had two things we could be really sure of, out of the list of eight there, we've now got six, which we have a really, really good chance of uh, identifying as reversible causes during uh, cardiac arrest or in the peri-arrest or post-cardiac arrest patient. So vascular access. Uh, vascular access... Uh, is something uh, that you can use at ultrasound for. Um, originally, I, I wasn't entirely sure if this would be something that was really relevant to paramedic practice, and we all like to think that we can cannulate. Uh, however, vascular access can be really, really good. Um, and one of the things I found when I've been doing this is that, that patients really 
get relieved when you get the ultrasound out because what generally happens is you you know as we all know you take that history from the patient you tell them you're going to cannulate them and the patient says to you oh they always struggle getting a you know a vein with me or they always struggle to get bloods uh, and, and you look at the veins and they're not great and you want to try and cannulate them first time and in the patients often are quite needle phobic because they've been in hospital they've had those repeated uh, cannulation attempts and you know they want you to try and get that cannula in first time and this is one of the things that you know ultrasound can really help you do and um, so this is a, a picture of myself uh, scanning one of my colleagues um, and showing you know basically using a linear probe uh, you can identify veins and then on the right hand of the screen you've got what you'll see uh, and as you can see I've marked it there for where the vein is so arteries generally when you're scanning them won't uh, collapse uh, so what basically we do a squish test on uh, on vessels to try and identify them and uh, what we've got here on the screen um, is uh, this is um, on the inner arm this is scanning someone's basilic vein and as you can see when I'm pushing down on the probe the vein collapses so I can identify that as a vein as I'm saying fluids black that's a black filled uh, uh, black fluid filled structure and by squishing it I know that that's a vein and so I can cannulate that that vein even though if you look at the markers at the side of the screen each one of those markers is uh, half a centimeter and you know that vein is one centimeter below the surface you wouldn't be able to palpate that vein and you wouldn't be able to see it but you can cannulate it under ultrasound and how we do this is by walking the, uh, the cannula or or shuffling the probe uh, to do this and uh, this is what my next uh, diagram shows so you identify your vein uh, so on the right on the left hand side of the screen you've got basically what the anatomy in the probe would look like and on the right I've tried to demonstrate uh, what that would look like on the screen and the needle although in reality the needle would be uh, in the midpoint of the probe I've done it off to the angle just so that you can see better of what we're trying you know what I'm trying to represent in this so the needles in the center of the probe uh, and the vessel is in the center of the probe and what you're going to do is you pass the uh, the cannula that, you know running uh, along the axis of the probe um, and the, the center axis sorry and what you see is what's on the right hand side of the screen so you've got that hyperechoic signal so needles with them being metal uh, reflect sound very well and so what happens is the probe sees that as being bright white um, so when you're looking at the screen you see this bright right return and what you can do is you can move the probe backwards and forwards and you can fan the probe and you can identify where the, the, the point of the needle is but you can also see where the vessel is so it, what we've got there is I know that it's nearly into the vessel what I can do is just gently move you know advance the cannula further in and eventually what I get is this so the needle tip is within the vessel and I get the returning signal um, from the tip of the needle uh, which looks like that bright white return that hyperechoic signal and I know that it's in there and quite often you'll get the flashback then and you can just pass the cannula normally because once you reach that point you don't need the ultrasound anymore it's the same as cannulating normally but what this allows you to do is cannulate vessels that you can't see and you can't palpate normally um, and the basilic vein is fantastic it's really really good uh, for patients who um, have you know have been cannulated a lot previously in the past in for intravenous drug users uh, who've damaged you know most of their veins uh, because it's quite deep and generally it hasn't been damaged by various you know various previous uh, cannulation attempts in drug use um, so it allows you to get um, a, you know a cannula in and I know what people will say you know why don't we just IO these patients um, but you know if this this patient is somebody who just needs some you know IV pain relief some morphine um, do you really want to IO them for that and it's also a great cost you know because an IO needle is about 80 pounds and a cannula is about a pound uh, and once you've got an ultrasound machine the only cost that I really have is for um, the gel and so you know you've got a, you've got a device that you can use to cannulate patients and the other thing is generally you can hopefully you know get this cannula in first time uh, instead of you know the patient having repeated cannulation attempts uh, and you wouldn't have uh, an introduction to, to ultrasound for paramedics without talking about fast and e-fast um, so 
the, the difference between fast and eFast is eFast also looks at the lungs as well. So we've already looked at that uh, in one of the previous slides where we were looking at pleural sliding. Um, so eFast, you basically you also have that element. Um, but fast is a focused assessment for shock, uh, uh, focused assessment of sonography and trauma, sorry. Uh, and that it's basically looking at the abdominal cavity and the heart uh, to see if you have any free fluid. And how we do this um, is that we scan, uh, if you look at this, we scan on the, uh, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, we scan the bladder in two planes, and then we scan the heart. So this is the right upper quadrant. And this is what you know you you would find if you had a patient with free fluid in their abdomen. And as you can see, uh, as annotated on this, uh, this diagram, uh, sorry, the scan, um, is that the liver, um, which uh, is that sort of speckly uh, organ up there at the top of the screen, and then you've got the kidney as well. And in between is black, and obviously black is fluid. There shouldn't be free fluid there. And what that is is a collection of free fluid in Morrison's pouch, um, and a lot of blood can collect there. Uh, so they say if it's, you know, if you've got about a, you know, a centimetre of blood, it can be about 500 mils of blood. Um, but obviously it varies from patient to patient and it's a bit of a rule of thumb. Um, but there shouldn't be free fluid there. Um, so that's obviously a positive scan uh, if you see that. Uh, and this is what you'd look for in the, the left upper quadrant. So you've got the spleen there, um, which obviously is on the right hand side of this scan. Um, and what you can see there is the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is quite hyperechoic, so it shows up as a white line. Uh, what's interesting on this scan is you can see that the free fluid isn't in the abdomen, it's up in the chest. Uh, so what we've got is a, is a pleural effusion uh, with, uh, you know, where you can see the tip of the lung sort of floating there in the fluid. Um, but, you know, if this was a, a trauma patient, um, this would be very suggestive of a, of a, a hemothorax or a hemoneumothorax. Um, so again, you, you know, this is a, a positive result and a fast scan. And then we're looking at the pelvis, um, and obviously there's lots of stuff about pelvic uh, trauma and, uh, and binding pelvises. And uh, so what we've got here, um, this is um, a, a longitudinal uh, scan of the pelvis, and what we can see there is obviously that this is a female, um, with a because there's a uterus there and there's a bladder um, up there on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, and uh, obviously posterior of the uterus we've got free fluid uh, and this is the uh, the pouch of Douglas uh, and this is where when you have free fluid uh, this is where this collects uh, and again this is a, a positive uh, an example of a positive uh, scan uh, for free fluid um, in the uh, the pelvis um, obviously we do fast uh, for trauma patients, there's also FAF, and uh, FAF is basically the same as FAST, but it's used in medical patients, um, and it's it's where you're looking for free fluid in things like ectopic pregnancies, because you'll get the same results. You'll see that free fluid uh, in the abdomen. Um, so you can't, you know, you, it's not that you can only use ultrasound for trauma patients. It's also very useful in uh, the, your medical patients as well, uh, in trying to work out if they have internal bleeding. You know, do you need to be an ultrasound ninja? Do you need to be absolutely fantastic in being able to do all these things? And I think, you know, there's elements of that uh, all paramedics could probably do in ultrasound. You know, I think vascular access would be great if we could get paramedics to be able to do that. Uh, in scanning the heart, and you know, not in lots of different accesses and in doing lots of fancy scans and measurements, but in cardiac arrest, I think the ability to look at the heart and see what's happening. You know, in a PE arrest, you know, if you've got in a complete standstill, it's very suggestive that the patient's going to have very poor. Uh, outcome so it's very prognostic um, so you know I, I think you don't need to be you know the most fantastic person at scanning uh, to use ultrasound but you need to be competent at the scans that you do so ultrasound training how do we train people now when I started doing this five years ago this was really difficult um, nobody really wanted to let paramedics do ultrasound um, it was quite a challenge um, trying to get access to placements was really difficult um, and if anyone wanted to let you in they wanted a lot of money um, I always talk about you know somebody tried to charge six thousand pounds for me to do a placement to do um, ultrasound in a local hospital um, because I was a paramedic and nobody paid for paramedics to do ultrasound placements 
conditions. And it's really difficult as well to get supervised practice um, because generally you get supervision from your own profession. Uh, and as there aren't paramedics using all the sounding vast numbers, uh, it was very difficult to get supervised practice. Um, and these things are slowly starting to change now. So there are paramedics who are doing um, you know, higher level courses in ultrasound. Um, so there are people who are now doing um, level seven or master's level courses in medical ultrasound. Um, and hopefully these people will be uh, the ultrasound leaders uh, for paramedics in the future. And they're gonna help us get those ultrasound placements and they're gonna help us get that supervised practice. Um, and one of the things that, you know, when everyone starts scanning and we, you know, it's still practice now is that we scan each other. Um, and but the thing about scanning each other is that it's great for looking at what's normal. So most paramedics are quite healthy. Uh, you scan them um, and you scan each other and what you see is what's normal. And the problem with that is you just don't see the pathology. So you don't see like in those earlier slides where I'm showing you, you know, the internal bleeding or the cardiac tamponades, you, you know, or the pneumothoraxes because when you're scanning each other, you're all healthy um, and there's nothing medically wrong with you. Um, and this is where technology is caught up. And so what we've got is things like that simulator on the top left hand corner and there's other simulators on the market as well. And what that allows you to do is practice scanning. Um, and it's not like using a model where eventually they're going to get sick of you repeating the same scan. Is that you can repeatedly do um, the same procedure to learn those psychomotor skills but also to look at can you identify that underlying pathology and you know, can you try and work out what you would do if you scanned a patient? Uh, one of the really nice things about that simulator there as well is it also shows you the anatomy. So you can also get it to show you the anatomy as well as what the ultrasound image would look out. And on the bottom left hand corner, that's a simulator, that's not a real ultrasound image. Um, and that shows you the quality now that you can get with an ultrasound uh, simulator. Um, obviously it's a heart. Um, and uh, you know you, what you can see as well is um, the aorta passing um, beyond the heart there as well. So what's the future? What are we going to do next? So you know in the past, uh, ultrasound machines were huge. They were the size of a room, and like everything with technology, they've generally uh, decreased in size. Uh, and what we've got now is, uh, as well as the V scan which I showed you earlier, which is the, uh, the, the device that I often use in practice. Um, you've got some new ones on the market. So Sonosite have brought out the iVis, which is the device on the left, uh, which is a bit like a, a tablet. It's a bit like an iPad or a, you know, um, a Kindle tablet or whatever. Uh, and it operates in a very similar way. It's touch screen. It's quite easy to use. Um, and you can, you know, it's got interchangeable probes on it. Uh, and what this allows you, you know, these machines are getting more powerful, they're getting smaller and they're getting easier to use. Um, but, you know, having something like an IVIS is now, you know, we're starting to get really good ultrasound images using these devices pre-hospitally. Um, so we, we've got things like the IVIS. And then we, you know, what everyone said, wouldn't it be great if you could have one that you could plug into your phone? And obviously someone was listening. And in this case, it was Philips. Um, and so Philips have got the Lumify uh, and this is a device where all the uh, the calculations, all that processing is done within the probe itself and then it sends the image uh, to an Android uh, smartphone or tablet and you can interpret the images off that uh, and you know there's there's been defibrillator manufacturers etc looking at how they could try and incorporate uh, ultrasound within their you know their their monitors uh, and if it's possible so the future may be that you know we have ultrasound probes attached to monitors or we may have them attached to our phones uh, but there's a lot you know I think what it's shown is in the last five years that I've been involved, um, you know ultrasound has become you know a lot more affordable you know five years ago, it was £25,000 plus for an ultrasound machine. You can now get an ultrasound for six, seven, eight thousand pounds So the cost has come down greatly. Um, you know, will we see one on every ambulance? We may do, uh, but you know, I think in specialist practice, particularly in critical care, for you know, specialist paramedics in critical care and advanced paramedics in critical care, I think ultrasound will be a tool that they use, um, you know, in their everyday practice. Uh, and I know, you know, in Edinburgh they've been using ultrasound. Uh, in my the team I'm involved with in Newcastle, we use ultrasound daily. Uh, London Ambulance Service are using ultrasound as well. Um, so this is already coming into practice uh, in some areas, and. 
thank you very much. Uh, there's a list of uh, references there. Um, there's my email address if anyone wants to contact me and uh, my uh, Twitter address if people want to follow me or if you want to contact me later. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, what a great presentation. Um, I'm just going to hand the screen back over to myself, and then uh, if people want to start posting questions, I'll ask uh, Paul some questions uh, in, in the next few moments. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And we'll just quickly go now on to the questions. So, as I said at the start of the presentation, if you want to ask Paul a question, if you just click on your question tab and you go to webinar drop down screen, you can post the questions in there um, and then we'll try and get you some answers. So I'll give you a minute or two just to post some questions and then we'll we'll see what we're going from there. So, um, Paul, one of the early questions we've uh, asked is, what, what do you think the minimum tra safe training is for a paramedic to deliver a point of care ultrasound in, uh, in cardiac arrests? So, I mean, this is this is one of those really tricky questions because if you're looking simply, you know, is the heart moving, is it not moving, um, you could probably do that in a short course. Um, I think if you want to start making clinical decisions using ultrasound, then you, you need to have a higher level course. Um, and most ultrasound is taught at master's level uh, in most other professions. And I think this is where we need to go. So we need, you know, we, we need to have in some ways two, two or three levels. So we need to have people who can look at, uh, you know, who are able to evaluate scans and decide, you know, with the, you know, the governance within the organisations and, and check that it's been done properly uh, and can do more complicated procedures and complicated scans. Uh, I think we need to have people who can do vascular access, you know, look at the heart and cardiac arrest, and then we need to have people who can just basically look and you know, see if the heart's moving. Um, I think, you know, short courses, so, you know, the um, in the team that we work in, uh, you're looking at, you know, a two-day introduction. Um, you're then doing what's called non-contributory scanning, so you're scanning patients to build up a portfolio of evidence that you're capable uh, of doing scans, and you're taking that back to your mentor who's looking at it, uh, who is somebody who, you know, is a, is a competent uh, user of ultrasound, and they're able to sort of work through that with you. And then at the end of that, um, you know, you, you have a finishing school, which is another two days, of checking that you haven't picked up any bad habits, checking that you're still safe, and then sitting some OSCEs uh, and some question papers as well. And I think you know that's a sensible, balanced approach uh, for somebody that's just using ultrasound in, in sort of everyday practice. For the more advanced practice stuff, um, you know, things like fast scanning and things like that, I think you probably need to get a postgraduate certificate to be able to do that, where you can, uh, you know, you can make clinical decisions from those scans. Excellent. Um... Okay, one of the other questions that we've got is, um, what do you feel as a paramedic who is using a pre-hospital ultrasound in your paramedic practice? How often do you feel you need to be scanning to maintain a level of competency? And does that vary from level to level depending on what you're scanning? Um, I, I find that you have to do it quite a lot. Um, it, it is a bit like riding a bike though. If you haven't done it for a while, you soon pick it up again. Um, but to able to, to use it quickly. I mean, I often talk about, you know, you need to be slick. You know, if you're scanning in cardiac arrest, as we all know, you, you know, your colleagues want you to be quick. They don't want you to be mucking about. Um, if you want to be able to do that, you have to be using it all the time. So, you, you know, you're looking at least, you know, a couple of times a month that you need to be scanning uh, to make sure that you're maintaining those skills. Um, but, you, you know, I can do a day where I'll do multiple scans and I can do a day where I'll do absolutely not um, because it depends on the patients um, that, uh, you know, you're seeing. Um, but, you you have to have frequent uh, scanning to maintain those skills. Um, so it's not something you can just do and then use once a year because when you need it, you need to be able to do it quickly. And uh, you know, and the thing is, sometimes it's very difficult to scan people. Uh, we always show examples. So the ones I've given, um, you know, they always look great. Um, but when you're scanning in reality, sometimes they don't look great. And you need to have the skill to be able to to optimize that image to be able to interpret it. And that, you know, the time to do that is not when you've got a cardiac arrest or a trauma patient. So you know, you need to make sure you're slick. So regular practice and regular, uh, you know, exposure to patients. Excellent. I've got a question from uh, Shane now. Uh, is the concept of pre-hospital ultrasound being introduced to paramedics, uh, student paramedics currently, uh, would that potentially be a positive move toward uh, bringing the practice closer to the frontline use and general awareness? So 
So I think basically the question there, Paul, is uh, do you think uh, we, we should be introducing this as a, as a taster into student paramedic programmes? Uh, yeah, I think I think what, what you could do with the student paramedic programmes is do an introduction into ultrasound um, and let people practice. What I think it would be very difficult to do is to, to you know, finish your paramedic uh, degree and be competent in the use of ultrasound. I think you'd need to have a lot more uh, sort of years of, of um, you know, practice before you could get to the level. And that's because, you know, when you're using that, you're also doing lots of other things. So if you're using it in cardiac arrests, um, you know, sometimes you're leading that cardiac arrest. And so, you know, you need to understand why you're doing that scan. And I think, you know, it's something that you need to do post preceptorship period. But I think equally, you know, I'm a really strong believer that if you look at other professions, they don't just, you know, there's no secrets to sort of introduce you know ideas and skills within the degree process uh, and then you hone them in practice later on post qualification so I'd love to see courses bringing ultrasound in I just think they have to be careful that you know people aren't going to leave those courses being competent in use of ultrasound but they would have done an introduction and hopefully build on that uh, later in the career. Excellent uh, I think we've gone to the final question and um, it's a maternity related one. Oh, there's another one propped up as well in a second, which I'll ask you shortly. But uh, the maternity related question is uh, Do you see uh, paramedics using ultrasound um, in obstetric care in the pre hospital environment to support, for example, uh, discharging patients on scene potentially and things like that? Uh, not for discharging patients on scene. Um, I think, you know, um, obstetric sonographers uh, train for so long to be able to reach a, a level of competence at that, and so do obstetricians. I think, you know, as a paramedic, it would be very challenging to do that. Uh, you'd have to be doing so much scanning in that environment. Uh, you'd pretty much be a sonographer, not a paramedic anymore. Uh, I think what it would be very useful for, and, and you know, I've, I've done this in, my, in some of my previous presentations on ultrasound, um, is around uh, the presentation of the baby. Um, because it, some of the biggest um, payouts from uh, for litigation from ambulance services are often around uh, maternity cases and how can we try and make that safer using ultrasound. And I think what we can do um, is if you learned how to scan to find out what the orientation of the baby was, that would all aid in your clinical decision making. Because if it's a normal cephalic delivery, you might think, you know what, I think I can manage that here. I think, you know, I've got the training and the confidence to deliver the baby here. But however, if you've got a transverse baby or if you've got a breech baby, you know, have you got the skills necessarily to manage that delivery? And that may be where you're starting to think, do you know what we need to move? Or we need to get help to us, and I think that's where ultrasound can help because trying to you know try mid midwives and doctors are trained to to work out which what the orientation of the baby by feeding the funders, but for paramedics to be able to do that, I think it'd be very challenging. But what we can easily do with an ultrasound uh, is work that out using ultrasound. Um, so I think that is an area that you know I'd really like to do some research into to see if paramedics could be using that uh, and if that could help in their clinical decision making. Excellent. Just a couple of final quick ones. First of all, I won't read this next one out. It's one. It's from one of your actual paramedic colleagues uh, who uh, I think is a bit of a football rivalry going on this evening. I think there's an important match down the road, but um, it, it was relating to how do you know the paramedics in Newcastle are healthy as opposed to Sunderland, but I don't think we'll investigate that one any further. Um, and um, is there any risk uh, with scanning? Uh, I think it says totty patient. Um, so I think there's been a typo there. So Chris, if you want to retype that, I'll ask I'll quickly ask Paul the question: Is there any any health risk with scanning? Scanning. I think it's meant to be to, to oh any risk scanning there uh, to the patient. Uh, so is there any risk to the patient using ultrasound, Paul? Uh, yeah, I mean anything like that, there's always risk. Uh, ultrasound is, is predominantly safe, um, but there's three areas where you have to be very very careful. Um, so very small fetuses. Um, Basically, what happens? It, you know, I didn't want to go into lots and lots of physics on this. I just wanted to do a very brief introduction, you know, which would be interesting to paramedics. But it, what happens with ultrasound is, is it travels through the body. Um, some of that energy is turned into heat. And what happens if you scan a very small fetus? Obviously, it's just a very, very small uh, thing within the fluid-filled uh, environment. Is that it heats them up? And what you can do is damage the fetus by scanning very small fetuses, um, newborn babies. Uh, you have to be very careful with as well, um, and uh, eyes. Um, so there is some people that advocate, uh, you know, scanning eyes. You can scan eyes, and it, it, but there is a risk around it because once you put ultrasound through any fil fluid-filled structure, um, you can start heating it up, um, and obviously your eyes are very, very delicate. 
Um, so if you bombard an, an eye with you know some really you know high uh, energy, if you increase the power, um, you can damage people's eyes with ultrasound, which is why it's generally done, um, you know, by uh, you know doctors specialising in eyes uh, who you are trained to use ultrasound. Um, so. Yeah, there, there are risks. There are scans that you don't do, and they are, you know, there's the the sort of ten commandments. If you ever do uh, ultrasound training, they talk about the ten commands and things like that. You know, is things that you know don't do scans that you're not trained and qualified to do. You know, the, I think one of the problems is that ultrasounds are now becoming more readily available, and people just tend to pick them up and play with them. Um, but like any sort of medical device, they they can be dangerous and they can, they can cause harm if you don't know what you're doing, which is why you know obviously myself, you know the college, everybody advocates that you do proper training and that you don't try to do scans that you're not capable of doing you know um, you know so although you know I'm I'm doing a master's degree in, in ultrasound I've never tried to do a scan that I've never been trained to do uh, you know I'd only do things that I feel that you know within my school of practice and which are safe to do um, but yes you know, going back to the question they, they are, you, you can cause harm with ultrasound but it's predominantly safe, and in the type of practice that paramedics would do, it, it's pretty safe. Okay, final question, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up because it's been a great presentation and talk so far. Uh, do the uh, do the advanced scanning procedures such as eFast have a useful impact in managing critical patients, uh, and how will this uh, impact your pre-hospital care management? Okay, so uh, so so for instance, you know, see, we're doing eFast. Well, eFast, you know, starting at the top. So if you if you're looking at the lungs, you're looking for pneumothoraxes. Um, so what this is allowing you to do is detect a pneumothorax. Um, you know, and, and it, all paramedics can deal with. You know, if you've got to start to get attention pneumothorax, but what this allows you to do is be a lot. You know, detect those with a lot more uh, sensitivity and specificity when you're using ultrasound. Um, you know, you look at the heart, cardiac tamponades. You know, uh, most paramedics, in fact, all paramedics. I haven't met any paramedic yet that is qualified to do a thoracotomy. Um, you know, if you've got a cardiac tamponade and that is what is causing the problem with your patient, then you, they need a thoracotomy. And what that's telling you is you need to do something different because if your current treatment isn't get that patient to a trauma center where they can do a thoracotomy or get somebody to the patient who can do a thoracotomy then it's probably not the right treatment so you know that's allowing you to identify things um, you know if you've got free fluid in the abdomen so if you've got you know blood in, in Morrison's pouch you've got you know a hemothorax or you've got you know, free fluid in the in the pelvis um, that that's telling you something, you know. And I often say that, you know, with ultrasound, sometimes it's, it's sticking a flag in things, it's highlighting them. You know, I think if you're pre-alerting a, a major trauma centre and you're saying, I've got a patient who has been, you know, been hit by a car, um, you know, complaining of pelvic pain, that'll probably get a bit of interest. But if you say you know, I've got a patient who's been getting by a car, complained of pelvic pain, I've scanned them and they've got free fluid in their in their pelvis. That's a whole different pre alert. That you know, that's where, you know, they're gonna start listening and think, right, you know, we need to do something. And I do wonder is is you know, in the future when we have paramedics who you know, who are consistently doing very good quality scanning, is you know, will we get to the stage where those scans are going to be what's aiding that, you know, that patient journey? And you know, you may have patients who go straight to theatre just based on the scan scans that have been done pre-hospitally and some of those new devices as well allow you to email them in advance so you could scan the patient on scene and send it to the major trauma center and they can review your scans before you've even walked through the door then they may look at the scan and say we're sending that patient straight to theater you know that patient needs to go to theater now um, and I think that's what the future is you know so it's not always that we can fix the problems pre-hospitally but sometimes what we can do is give the people in the next stage of the patient's journey a heads up of what it is that they're com that's coming into them um, and I think that's you know, one of the real great values of pre-hospital ultrasound yeah great great answer there Paul so pre-hospital ultrasound a little bit part of the chain of survival really um, final question, sorry, I thought that was the last one, but somebody else has squeezed it in. So Samuel, um, I'm just going to give you the last question. Uh, do you find yourself using ultrasound for day-to-day -day routine jobs or mainly more serious cases? Um, I, I mean, I find, uh, you know, that um, I, I use it, you know, in day-to-day -day things. I mean, I'm quite lucky um, because, you know, obviously, you know, do, doing the course that I'm doing, um, you know, I've got... There's a lot of different scans that I've been trained to do, um, but I mean I find the vascular 
or access thing is just so useful. Um, and it's something I've, I've really got a bit of an interest in that because I think what what I've seen is that you know where I looked at it as being a, you know a, a mode of, of cannulating or getting you know vascular access in a patient. What I've actually seen is that the patients so you know the response from the patients isn't why are you using that, but you know all oh, this is really good because generally they have to do repeated attempts. And uh, you know, in generally using ultrasound, you, you're probably going to get that cannula in on the first attempt because you're doing it visually, you know, on the screen. Um, you know, so you know, wherever you know, if I think I'm going to have problems getting a cannula in, and I've got, if I've got an ultrasound available with a linear probe, um, I, I'll use it. Um, you know, I don't want my patients to have multiple cannulation attempts. Um, I want the, the cannula in one time. Um, you know, causing the least amount of you know, uh, you know, of trauma, not as if damaging the patient, but you know, of upset. You know, people don't like being cannulated generally. Um, you know, and least amount of pain. And I think you know that's something that ultrasound could really add to paramedic practice, which is you know instead of having these repeated attempts, we could try and get that cannula in first time. No, uh, I, I totally agree, Paul. And uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank you very much for what was an excellent presentation this evening. Um, I'm sure all those listening would, would fully agree with that. And we've getting a lot of lots of complimentary messages through there. Um, what I will just finish up with for the, those who are watching this evening is uh, just to remind you um, that um, your certificate and uh, a copy of the um, the webinar will drop into your uh, CPD portfolio within the next 24 hours. Um, for those who are members of CPD Me, that will automatically go in, into your CPD Me records. Um, and if you then want to go in and reflect at some point, then do so because I think there's a lot to reflect on there today from from Paul Younger's excellent talk. Um, in addition, um, obviously you can go into your report manager as you see on the screen there if you're a CPD member and change what you need to do. And finally, uh, I would just like to remind you um, that these webinars are freely available um, and there's, there's, there's more on the system ready to come in the coming months. If you visit, visit www.cpdme.com forward slash webinar, you'll see some more webinars to register on. Um, that includes, um, I think, a series on maternity cases that Andy Omrod and his team's got coming up. And um, also there's a one on introduction to research that I'll be doing next month. Um, and, and, and much, much more to come in the near future. Uh, so without further ado, I'd just like to thank uh, again Paul Younger for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, and thank you to everyone who attended this evening. Um, and good night and enjoy your evening. Many thanks. <laughs>